All right, Matt, uh, let me write this down. So, okay, so July 14th is the date of the wedding, and it's on Panda Island in World of Warcraft. Do we dress code as elites only? We wear all our legendary gear and... Is no, that... we're good. I'm gonna be I'm gonna be sending you the dress attire uh, in a later email. Yeah. Okay. And this is actually your third wedding in World of Warcraft. What happened to the other two? Did Just they... didn't work out. Wasn't they weren't the one? The guilds broke up or something. You know <laughs> that that guild drama. I know how it could be. Yeah, 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 yeah. Is this a thing? Uh, uh, World of Warcraft. What have you been to a World of Warcraft wedding? I have been to one, and that's when you I have been to a World of War. No. It's when I decided to quit my guild. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I'm not doing these freaking, it was a mandatory World of Warcraft wedding in my guild. And like, I showed up and it was like long and people were like setting off the little fireworks and stuff. And I was like, I think I'm done with this guild. And then I'm I, out. Yeah. So it wasn't an actual real wedding though. It was just a... I don't even know, to be honest, like, okay, I, it was so long ago that I don't remember if it was like actually celebrating a real wedding or if they were doing a LARP in game wedding and their <laughs> characters were married. I don't know, but I quit and I started a stealth only guild and all we did was troll everybody and it was great fun. And I was like, this nice. is how I want to play WoW. But speaking of WoW, the reason why I bring up WoW, welcome to the podcast, everybody. Welcome to Level With Me. The reason why Welcome. I bring up WoW is because WoW was like, you know what we need in our long-standing MMO, the MMO of all MMOs, is we need a Battle Royale mode, which just launched, <laughs> like, last week, I think? Yeah, that was really surprising. Kind of, It literally came out of nowhere. I didn't know, I had not heard anything about it. I I watched a couple of streams on it, and... It looked kind of neat, actually. It got me thinking about, like, yeah, MMOs could have battle royale. Sort of the the timing strategy, the combat, and WoW is not bad. Like, there's there's a lot of nuance to it, and there's a lot of people that take it really seriously. So they have the fighting meta down to a degree. So throwing to it degree. into a royale environment sort of makes sense to me. Um, yeah. So it, it looked like it had like a leveling system where you have to go around and take out mobs and those mobs give you levels so that you can get, you know, stronger. And then you also fight other players and like there's a zone. Um, but that's about as far as I watched. I didn't really <laughs> look into the the metas or, I'm surprised like, you yeah. know, big strategies. I mean, honestly, I thought you were going to jump into it because you do jump back to WoW when they do like a DLC or something, you know? But when... I don't do that, actually. I haven't oh. played World of Warcraft since, I think, Legion. Not Legion? Legion. When was Legion? Oh, that was many expansions of pack uh ago yeah. yeah yeah okay okay i was just curious because I, I think you've played a lot more wow than me or at least you played it probably more recently that was than me. that was my game in college like i put i was a uh resto druid and i got gladiator rank i'll have you know i was a gladiator in the arena mm -hmm. 3v3 and wow. uh yeah i i put way too much time to that oh everybody <laughs> everybody on the planet did i i purposely quit the game because i was just like Either this can just be my life or I could do something else. <laughs> yeah, I remember I, my, yeah. my roommate came back after like he, he had classes. I can't remember. It was maybe the weekend. And I was playing when he when I when he left and then he came back like seven hours later and, and I was still playing. He's like, are you still playing? I was like, no, no, I took a break. Totally. I, did, I, I wasn't sitting here all day. I sat there all day. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we all knew and probably many of us still know those people who are just like, World of Warcraft is their life outside of work. You know, I remember mm -hmm. working at like Kinko's in college, the copy copy yep. shop, you know, you make uh -huh. copies for people and then people would just go home after work and they would just play WoW until they fell asleep and then come back into work the next day. And that was just the cycle. It was almost it's, it was almost kind of like a social media in its own right, where you actually like met people and you talked to people. You had like fr you made friends in like oh, World of Warcraft. Sure. For it sure. was. I, I feel like that's something that's been missing in a lot of world, and not, not just not as WoW, but also MMOs in general, because everything is now instance. You just queue up, you play with randoms, and it's it's more of a single player experience. I I don't know if that has changed because mm. I I hear that they've been trying to make it more um, like server based in some respects, but 
It I think it's probably what it. you seek out because they want you to be able to enjoy the game without having to group up with yeah. tons of people, right? Like, because yeah. that that you don't want to add too many layers of requirements to any game before the average person can enjoy it. So they they try and make it accessible, and then I think if you want that more social aspect, you you kind of have to seek it out, right? Got yeah yeah I agree yeah so no weddings for you recently I'm I'm not hopping into the battle royale but you know if uh, anybody watching the pod has let us know in the comments what you think about the battle royale and also uh, welcome to the level with me podcast we appreciate you all being here we've got some new faces in the uh, the live chat right now if you guys want to join our Patreon you can watch the podcast live and we even have a little session after the podcast it's a nice way to support what we do here. Uh, before we start getting that ad money for those vitamin D supplements, man. Oh, yeah. Can't wait for that ad money to come rolling in. <laughs> but it, but until then, you can help support us <laughs> in the Patreon and uh, ask us questions in our Discord server for um, subject suggestions and whatnot. Uh, all yep. the links for that are in the video description or in the podcast description on whatever podcast platform you're on. So, Matt. Yep. Are you as excited about Unreal Engine 5.4 as I am? <laughs> Woo, baby. No. Yeah. I mean, yes, but no. It is funny how I've never paid attention to the iterations of Unreal Engine versions that much, uh -huh. right? Like a little bit, just topically, if there was some really cool feature coming out, one of the future ones. But now that I'm using it more regularly, each each feature coming out in the patch is like a big deal to me. Uh, they just had GDC last week, Games Developer Conference in San Francisco. Uh, they hold it every year. And Unreal Engine 5.4 debuted there, showing off Marvel 1943. Did you watch that trailer? That, I watched the trailer, and the, like, you know, trailer, it looked like they're people now. They're starting just to look like people. Yeah. It's, well, so a recent, this kind of blends in with what you're saying. Unreal Engine is used a lot in the film industry now. It's becoming more and more popular uh, right. to do they use it in star wars to as do like cgi yeah and it's great because they can do real-time visualizations as the actors Lighting. on the green screen and stuff and they can nope. they can see a pretty good portrayal of what it's going to look like and product and then in the uh, i think they call it the volume in star wars where they create a uh, a 360 degree room that projects yeah. the environment around them. the actors it lights mm -hmm. them does all that cool stuff now they can see that rendered in real time because I think a lot of it runs on the Unreal Engine, so they can see pretty decent game game level graphics, which are now almost film level graphics. But, yeah, I'd say it's yeah. more it's more like real life at this point, like because <laughs> you're not having to render. It's not like you don't need like an FPS or anything like that. It's just a background. Yeah. And yeah, it's it's wild. It's cool stuff. But one thing that. Uh, Epic just started doing is they started charging a yearly subscription fee for the Unreal Engine if you're using uh, film, using of it for film they, of content. Well, it kind of makes sense because every linear editor system has some sort of pay or subscription fee or something mm. behind it. And now that Unreal is becoming such a popular graphics options for film and movie and stuff, they're like, well... I mean, it's time to start charging the money. Luckily, it's still completely free for game devs uh, until you make a million like, dollars or yeah, more. Yeah. And then you got to cough good. up, cough up 5%, which I would argue is still pretty, it's a, it's a pretty generous fee, all things considered. It used to be more than that. Um, but I thought thanks, it was more than 5%. Yeah, that's not bad. No, I think thanks to Unity, they really had to get very competitive with Unity, and so they just... Well, because like, also, if, if it's selling... Because it's 5% for them, and then it's, what, 30% for Steam, and it's like, there's all there's there's other things taken away, right? Yeah, yeah, no, the they nickel and dime you. And I think Steam is like, after you make something... After you sell something crazy, it's like 10 million copies of your game. They like lower it from 30% to 25%. You're like, oh, you you shouldn't have Valve. You oh, you man. Really shouldn't have. Surprise is not the other way around. Yeah. <laughs> did you know that Valve, um, they did a study, it might have been back in like 2019 or something, but I'd imagine it probably still holds true. They make more money per employee than any other company in the world. 
Like wow, yeah, it was some obscene amount. It was like seven hundred thousand per employee or something like 700, that. Seven hundred thousand per year. <laughs> 700,000? What am I doing? Yeah, I know. Well, I'm not smart, so that's... Pro okay, now well, I've you're not the problem. you're not charging every game developer on the planet 30% a cut of their revenue. That that's what you're not doing. That is insane amounts of money. What am I, I know. doing? I know. What are, yeah, exactly. Uh, I'd say you should make video games, but you shouldn't because you, you're just going to pay Valve 30%. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, uh, so getting back to Unreal Engine 5.4, the Marvel teamed up with them to demo 5.4 and all the new features, and it is stunning. Like, Unreal Engine 5 has been showcasing some stuff that is just jaw-dropping in general. They, they debuted the engine with Nanite and Lumen, mm. which are their new uh, lighting and high, high, high poly rendering systems. Now they're upgrading that with uh, Nanite seeing much further progression with all these super deep um, texture additions to Nanite topography and stuff. And they're adding in this new way of rendering clouds and smoke stuff that is far more accurate, far more realistic. It's really cool. And so they showed it all working in basically a Marvel 1943 demo level where a guy's just walking around it and showing off all the tech. And Oh, I didn't realize there was an actual, like there was gameplay of it. Well, yeah. Not gameplay, but at least, you know, showcasing it in engine and not yeah. just a cutscene. Yeah, of course. And of course they went overboard with the presentation where rather than just some guy on a controller walking around, they had a dude with a camera that was like tracking his 3d movement. So he was like, he was like steady cam moving it into things and looking closely at the snow and all this stuff in real time. And it wow. was funny because everybody, as soon as they were like, we're going to do this demo live, everybody was like, wait for the crash, boys. You know, they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Did it good? crash? No, it didn't crash and it looked great. Uh, nice. Really impressive tech. I've just, games are getting to that level where they really are. It's going to be, I don't know what the next five years is going to look like. They might just look like real, you know? Well, because there's a moment where they you look at um, the the actor for Black Panther, and there's yeah. there's glimpses where you're like, "That's a person. That's not. Yeah. That's 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 literally just a person." Mm -hmm. There's uh, there's another one that they were demoing with um, real time recording an actor, and then uh -huh. they convert it to the 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 CG character in the game. And as they transition between the real footage of her and the CG one. It's almost unclear <laughs> which, which when is, they're yeah. the only thing that makes the transition obvious is all of a sudden all these flames appear around her and they do all this cool, you know, uh, CG stuff. But yeah. otherwise, you're like, I'm not seeing any clear markers as to why, w what makes her fake in this scene versus real in that scene. Yeah, I feel like we're getting past the whole uncanny valley now. And now it's just like these are people. Yeah. Yeah, at least at least when you work with motion capture stuff. I don't know if yeah. we're quite there with animators fully faking it. No, or, uh, yeah, we're not there yet, but we're getting we're probably getting, not we're far. Close. Probably not far. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was pretty cool. I thought that was kind of neat from the the game dev perspective. Yeah. Yeah. So what have you been you Have you played what have you been playing? Dragon's Dogma 2. Yeah. I I want to know about that cuz from the outside perspective, we see the yeah. stories of the Steam Oh, it's, oh, review it's hot bombs. right now. Yeah. Yes, it's hot. Which I do well, think, from my perspective, seems a bit overblown. Or, okay, good, because it kind of is. A little, or a little at the bit, very little, least, little bit overblown. totally bit. unavoidable by the devs, because... Yeah. How much money are they really making off of... For Let's just catch people up to speed with some of the dragon's dogma 2 drama surrounding its launch okay so this is a bit of a very highly anticipated game the original dragon's dogma is a beloved i wouldn't say like cult classic but it, it it's it's wasn't as well known as maybe some of the other big rpgs but the showcase of gameplay has had a lot of people excited it looks fantastic it reviews well and day one on steam out of nowhere i didn't even know that there were microtransactions uh, we learned that there are little DLCs that you can buy. You can buy like little port crystals. You can buy a camping site for your uh, for your companion. You can buy like a bunch of little, just a little little knickknacks here and there that can yeah. sort of help you along your journey. 
I literally did not know that that was in the game at all. And apparently there was like no reviewers that even mentioned it as well. And it just they might have the, likely the reviewers wouldn't have known about it too. That's pretty common within the game world as well. I heard that some of them were told, but some of them also didn't look at it because they didn't want to get spoiled. Like sometimes they get like yeah. a review sheet to like let them know what's like in the game, and some of them don't read that because they don't want to get that to influence their 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 playthrough. Mm -hmm. Which is somewhat of a you know you could you could have looked at it after the fact, but whatever. That's besides the point. Yeah, and um, well, and also reviewers usually have like ten games that they're working on, and there's like. True. 10 different PDFs. It can get they, a little overwhelming. They don't always pay attention to every little thing. They're like, you know what? I'm just going to play the game and give my feedback and not pay attention to all the other stuff in the fine print, which, yeah, I, you know, is fair, I think. So long story short, it's a $70 video game. And then all of a sudden out of nowhere, seemingly nowhere, microtransactions show up in your single player video game. Now yeah. it's slimy. It is. It's gross. And some of them are helpful um it the thing is is that if i had not been told there was microtransactions i would have probably never have expected there to be yeah. anything to assist you it was it's like the game doesn't really feel like it's pushing me to buy the microtransactions which is really nice right yeah which is what you want yeah when you um, die it's not like go buy a five dollar revive vial or something right you can't while you're in game you can't even buy them you have to literally go to the steam page to be able to pick them up and most of them you'll find in game no problem i think there's like one or two things that you literally cannot get in game just by playing um so it's not like it's all like you can do in game but for the most part it's pretty unobtrusive i think the reason why people are so upset by it is it's a slippery slope right? yeah this it's, is a preview of what's to come essentially yeah. they're like let's this, start them off easy mm -hmm. with some some fairly benign things but you know, next year or whatever, single player games are all of a sudden going to have microtransactions, which is like, oh, sorry, you wanted to play Yoda in the new Star Wars game called Yoda's Revenge or something? Yeah, that's going to be another. <laughs> that's the game I want. Yoda's yeah. Revenge. You know, you would play Yoda's Revenge. I mean, like, I would. Everybody would play Yoda's Absolutely. Revenge. Absolutely. But yeah, and, and then they're going to be like, oh, uh, you wanted uh, Mace Windu's purple lightsaber? Sorry, you got to pay the five bucks for his purple lightsaber. You only get, you know, green or some crap. Yeah. The, so the fact that it's even here is what is just feels really slimy because, and this is Capcom. So, and they've done this in, in the past with like Resident Evil. They have, this is not the first time they've done microtransactions in a single player game. And it's always felt gross back then too. But this just really, I feel like it just hit different because people just were not expecting it. And some of them are helpful. And I know people are saying that they're like people are overreacting. And I think they are overreacting. Yeah. But it is that like slippery slope and it's that slow like push. They just keep pushing the boundaries and pushing the boundaries. Yeah. And sometimes they go too far. The The big push was for uh, uh, Battlefront, Battlefront 2. That mm -hmm. was like where yeah. gamers were like, you're going way too far. And then there was a big backlash. And then, then it, it there was a, there was a, a halt. But remember, you know what, 2015 years ago, horse armor, people freaked out about horse armor. And now literally that's everywhere in like yeah. microtransactions. So there is this slow creep. It, it does happen. It happens. It, it, the pioneers yeah. with it get the backlash because they're, yep. they do it first and then people slowly just get used to it. It sucks. And yep. it's, Part of why I actually do support these massive backlashes, because while I think Dragon's Dogma 2 is probably, and you can tell us in a second, is probably a pretty cool game, uh, having this kind of review bomb backlash that hurts the sales sends the message as to like, hey, you guys want to add some slimy crap to your game and try and make this an industry standard? you're going to lose money. So you pioneers mm -hmm. are going to take a major hit to your sales because guess what? I see the reviews and I see the massive negative reviews. I'm going to think twice about buying the game now. And so without question, they're losing sales because of messing with the microtransaction stuff. So I hope it sends a message to other devs to back the F off with your right. MTX That's stuff in your single though, player yeah. games. The problem is that single player games are the they they're a complete 
financial loop because you don't have to run most of them. You don't have to run a server on the back end. Mm -hmm. So you don't have all these overhead costs, which is what, what a lot of live games are trying to do. They're trying to not only pay for their server fees, but make continuous revenue so they can keep updating the game. A single right. player game makes the money on the sales. Hopefully they make enough to make a sequel or some DLC or DLC, whatever, yeah. but don't, don't make it a continuous revenue stream, which is what they're all heading for. But I just don't, I hope that enough people fight back against it because we don't want it in the sense, the single player is just, it's a complete thing. Leave it at that. We don't need the MTX crap on top of it. Yeah, no, I, I do agree. The one thing about the microtransactions that I. How much did you buy, Matt? hundred uh, dollars worth? Uh, yeah. I, I think, I think, it'll, I think it's $40 total if you buy every single one of them. And it's, yeah. It's I, like the cost I have of not, a whole, I have not, whole game. I have not spent a single dime. The thing is, is that there, <laughs> there is one that I could see people wanting to buy, which is I think called a port crystal, which you can put mm -hmm. on the ground, which allows you to fast travel to that location. And you can pick it up whenever you want as well. And you do get some of them in the game, but there's also port crystals that are permanent around the map. So there's like, I've gone to two cities so far, well, one major city, then like one like town. And that allows you with a fairy stone to be able, which are also very rare, to be able to fast travel to these locations. Mm -hmm. Fast travel in this game is very rare. And you are going to be exploring on foot like 90% of the time. Maybe yeah. end game, once you get more money, you can start buying them more readily. Sure. But what I was not expecting is that you will travel to a completely different city, almost in like a different biome. It's literally a different biome. Yeah. And it doesn't have a port crystal there. So you have to have wow. found one of these crystals to place it down outside if you want to travel there quickly. Now there is like- This is like parts. old school RPGs yes. where they're just yeah. like, yeah, you want to go to that city? Go to that city. You're like, but it's 10,000 miles. You know, there are ox carts that you can take, which yeah. will to go, to go to certain places, but that's and that is kind of fast travel ish. It is, but uh -huh. it's also kind of slow where you have to take like multiple of them. Remember, like World of Warcraft, you have to take like a, a, a griffin yeah. to like one city to another city to another city. It's like that. And then you're like, um, is there a wizard I can pay to port me somewhere? You know, yes, yeah. <laughs> But the thing is, is that because there doesn't seem to be any of these uh, crystals, I've only found two. <laughs> I have mm. like 30 hours in the game. I've only found two are they, that are in permanent are they, areas. Once you get them, are they permanent or is it like a single use thing? They are permanent, yes. So okay. once you find the ones that you can place on the ground to then use that as a teleport spot, they are believe they are permanent. And so you can there's a pretty up. big incentive to buy one from the store, like that. Especially could considering they are so rare, speed yes. up your game then essentially. Yeah, because I'm now in a place that is so far away from everything else, and I'm looking around hoping that there's going to be a like like. Hopefully I can like teleport here at some point because I don't want to have to run through the gauntlet of what I just went through to get here again yeah. if I have to go do some other quest and I cannot find one. So I could really see someone being like, all right, well, I guess I'll buy this so I can actually mm. place it down. That's um, really frustrating. Like it's, yeah. it's fine if that's the design of the game and they want people to like really consider what it means to go that far away from a major point and being on your own. But not if there's a cheat, essentially, to get around it that you can pay money for. It's it's pretty yeah. dirty. Um, and so I've 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 come across two of them, and maybe I'm just bad and not doing the right quests or whatever, and I just have gotten really unlucky. But they're they're already placed on the map, and I didn't expect I needed to carry one because I just assumed that there would be more than just two of the permanent. I figured there would be at least a couple in like major cities around. So I don't want to yeah. jump to conclusions. It may not be a big deal, and I'll find one. But so that so was the like game. one critique I had. How is the game in general? Like the game itself is awesome. Yeah, <laughs> like it's really really fun. It reminds one of my favorite things about Elden Ring was the sense of exploration and and stumbling across a a dungeon and then all of a sudden you're going down into a mine and you you come across an ogre and you take out the ogre and it's like that is such a gratifying gameplay loop and then once you we're down there and you defeat the boss you find a new weapon or a new piece of armor that makes you look badass like that gameplay loop resonates with me like no other and it does a really good job with that. Cool. The combat is also really varied. There's 10 different classes and all of them, they, they share like some similarities in like how like the flow works, but like you got a ranger, thief, warrior, fighter, and they all play pretty differently from each other. And they're all very satisfying for the most part. Yeah. Um, 
So that's been really fun. Did you uh, kill a knight and or uh, an ogre and make it a bridge yet? Did you do that? I have not made it a bridge, but I did knock an ogre over into like the water. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. No, it's <laughs> and it's cool because like they'll start to tip and you're like, oh, they're tipping. And then you can. So as a thief, you can like lash on like a rope and then pull them down. Nice. And yeah, it's it's the the physics is incredible because They'll also interact with the environment. So if you push an ogre like into a wall, it'll hit the wall and it will like kind of crumple backwards and scorpion a little bit because it's interacting with the world. Which that is, is so really cool. cool. It's yeah. funny because you normally don't think of fantasy games as like being technologically impressive. It's more about narrative and, you know, showing off some cool particle effects and stuff with spells and whatnot. But Having the idea, ogre physics as being like a major selling point for uh -huh. a fantasy game is super cool. And even I, I saw yeah. the trailers and I was like, dang, that does look cool. Like, I'm not really much of a fantasy guy gamer, but I see that and I'm like, oh, dynamic ogre physics. Like, yeah, sign me up. It all feels really organic, too. Because I there's there's griffins and I think it's like all throughout the trailers and you fight like there's a griffin fight and griffin a fight lot of, a lot of them will fly off yeah and you can latch onto the back of it but I had this incredible battle with one didn't actually kill it because it was able to eventually fly away but I as it's trying to fly away and flee I grab onto its back and I just start like wailing on it as it's like <laughs> soaring and it takes me so far away I mean, <laughs> like it's cruising my pawns are running after me then i take it down it falls to the ground we have another battle and then it tries to fly away again i grab onto its tail as it's le like as it's soaring up i jump and grab on climb on and then it bucks me off but that entire engagement i've never experienced in a video game before that is and so cool it is really really cool yeah that's that's what I think you sort of imagine the future of games to be when you're a kid, right? So, mm -hmm. so I had the, the future of space gaming, right? But if you were a fantasy gamer, this is what you would have thought about for fantasy games. It's like, what about a game where everything was interactive and dynamic and it wasn't preset to do all these things mm -hmm. and just mm -hmm. depending on what I chose to do, crazy things would happen and we wouldn't be bound by all these invisible walls and rules. Yeah. It's exciting, man. I, I love hearing about this kind of stuff. It seems like fantasy gaming all of a sudden with Baldur's Gate 3 and now Dragon's Dogma 2 are like throwing down the gauntlet. And they're like, hey, uh, it's not just about like Call of Duty anymore, guys, or or what the next crazy, impressive uh, graphics insanity game can do. Like, we're going to take it in a different direction. We're going to blow your minds. Yeah. Now... Uh, so, and this is, so yes, one great thing about that is that it makes it feel more lived in and authentic where you are not like you're, it's, let's go to the quest. Let me transition to the quest. Okay. Some of the quests are great. Some of the quests are absolute dog water to sound <laughs> no. like a millennial. Um, yeah. they Kill 10 rats. Try, no, 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 no. Well, sometimes yes. Okay. Um, not actually, no, no, there's no like, go, go out and take out 10 things. Right. But they are they're they're much more organic but because they're trying to make it feel it doesn't hold your hand like at all <laughs> like yeah. there'll be quests that will tell you like they're over here somewhere and you got to uh -huh. just go over there and try and find them they're in the dark which, forest and you're like okay mm -hmm. yeah and sometimes that's great and you can go around and talk to different villagers and try to like understand like where to go but i feel like because they went like halfway with the the quest system where it's like it holds your hand a little bit but then sometimes it will just all of a sudden out of nowhere be like all right now just figure it out but it doesn't tell you this is the part mm. where it tries to figure it out it can get really confusing yeah and you have to stay consistent with that in a game where either you're expecting to be sherlock holmes and like right. read all the clues and talk to everybody or you're expecting a quest marker to pop up on your map but alternating and it does back both and forth of them Exactly, yeah, which makes oh, yeah. it really convoluted at times. We're like, okay, so now what? Did it? Did, did the quest marker just not update? Am I like doing something wrong? Yeah. Which, so that 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 really kind of adds to that confusion. Um, and other times, you're just not really sure what the hell you're supposed to do. So, a really good example of this is I was supposed to follow a guy and to, uh, under, to figure out it's like a like a side quest. I was mm -hmm. sort of figure out like what he's doing to get money. Um, so he's he's just this merchant guy. He's walking away. And I, I I follow him for like five minutes and he mm -hmm. and he arrives at a bar and he just starts 
talking at the bar. And so I just sit there for another minute. He doesn't go anywhere. And then I walk up to him. A cutscene happens. And then nothing happens. So I went up and approached him. He's like, hi. I was like, hi. And then I talked to my chat. They're like, yeah, you weren't supposed to talk to him. You were supposed to wait for him to, a little bit longer. And then he would go off somewhere else. I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> like, mm. what do you mean? Yeah, I'm that's, supposed to that's, wait poor, even that's poor game design right there. It's, yeah. I was like, you got to kind of convey this to the player of like, are they doing something right? It's like, uh, yeah. It, so it's tricky because you want the full immersion experience, mm -hmm. which should not have and hold these stuff in there there right. should be like a little timer or something that says now talk to the guy at the same time how long do you expect players to sort of try and imagine that they've chosen the right path and nothing happens right, right. like they're only going to stick with that for so long before they're like oh clearly i didn't do the thing the way that the game wanted me to do it so yeah yeah 10 you should have waited 10 minutes matt you should have wa waited 10 minutes you didn't wait yeah. the 10 minutes you know which is what any good any good spy would have done and then and now you have failed the mission yeah um <laughs> uh, so and that that those quests are a little obnoxious but there is there is a great sense of exploration because of it and it can and when you do come across those quests that feel organic and you figure out the puzzle or you you figure out what you're supposed to do. It, it feels rewarding. So it they're not terrible, but there are some that are 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 pretty rough because I feel like they didn't have enough time in the oven in some regard. Um, do you give another, the, do you give the game a recommendation for your? So yes and no. The game is not optimized mm. at at all. That's um, a shame. If yeah. The cities can drop down to like 45 frames per second, even on my PC. Even on, I'm your, on like Matt, what are you on, Mr. 3080 Ti, 5950 okay. X CPU. So it's not top of the line, but it's also not. That's a good card. Like, that's yeah. a pretty good. That's a pretty good setup. Um, and it and there are some battles that happen in the city, and you're going to be at a low frame rate. And sometimes you'll be out in the world where you're getting, you know, 80, which is decent, not like great, but and it will all of a sudden drop down if there's a lot of NPCs around. It seems to be very CPU based in this title. Mm -hmm. And if there's a lot of NPCs because there's so much physics going on, it'll it'll tank, which can also be quite rough. So depending on your PC, it may not be the best time to just jump in right now. Yeah, that's a shame but, also because fantasy oriented gamers aren't usually the people with the cutting edge PCs. You know, they're not trying to squeeze out frame rates for some competitive FPS game. They're just like, yeah, my computer's five years old. What's the what's the big deal? And console isn't much better because they're yeah. at thirty. They're locked at thirty, and sometimes they'll dip below thirty. Mm. That's it's, tough, yeah, man. That it, it is tough. It seems like they're really pushing far with this game from a tech perspective, which I can appreciate. But it's at some point they were just like, "Uh, we're not going to be able to hit these frame rate benchmarks that you guys set out from the start." Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. So on the one hand, yeah, that's that's so it's it's hard to like just straight up recommend to everybody because of yeah. it. Yeah. But man, I'm I'm I I love it because it's it it does feel like an old school RPG and you go around and you just have these great moments where you're exploring, you're fighting dragons and it's you know, great that they were and... able to do that and um capture some of that magic. Cause it's funny, it's not like a brand new gameplay loop of saying, hey, go off to this direction, but along the way we're gonna throw all these little side quests in your path and you're gonna be naturally lured away. Like that's been in games forever, but doing it correctly is sort of is the art form. And either you do it right or you don't. And yeah. having all those extra assets and abilities to make it feel natural and cool and immersive. Uh, it sounds dope, and I hope we start seeing a lot more games like that, whether it's fantasy or or any other single-player game that can create that sense of true immersion and dynamic interaction with the world. The, the, the one thing I want to say is that while... So going back to Elden Ring, how much I like... It's like one of my favorite games of all time. Yeah. Because of that sense of exploration, and one of the reasons why that sense of exploration was so much fun is because of the rewards that you get, which this game does have. At mm -hmm. the end of the dungeon or whatever, you get something cool. The unfortunate part is they don't have a lot of small minion variety. Uh, you fight harpies at the beginning. Mm -hmm. You fight wolves, goblins, and I think there's one more that's eluding. Uh, and salamanders, basically these big giant lizard things. <laughs> Naturally, <clears throat> the four food groups, as one would yes. expect. The, harpies, the, the, the salamanders, wolves, and goblins. Yeah. And you fight them a lot. And then, <laughs> as it progresses, you fight goblins that are green. And then goblins that have armor. 
And then you fight salamanders that this are. This is the rock. early two thousands way of giving uh, a- a- enemy variety. Let's. What yeah. if it was green? Now what if it's yeah. purple? Which I give them a pass for because they had lots of system requirements to. Like you couldn't just throw a billion models into a game and expect people to be able to play it. But well, it's, that's that's yeah. why I love Elden Ring so much. Is that they? While yeah, a lot of the like trash mobs that you fight are pretty basic and then you know they're not insane or anything. But they're they're so much variety. It's like holy cow, what is that monster yeah. what is that creature and that's that sense that gives me that sense of exploration and so after a while i did notice and i think i think people more the longer they're playing are starting to realize it's like this is just the same enemy i've been playing but slightly different mm-hmm. from the very beginning like this salamander is just red with like rocks on its back like <laughs> which is fine but it was a little bit of a downer yeah. and yeah okay. so it's a fantasy all, game you you have a yeah. D a you know creature book creature and cycle whatever that book is called or it tells you about all the monsters in D. there's like a thousand things in there just go in and right. pick some more you know right 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 so my overall it's not a review or anything like that game is fantastic when it works the low frame rate sucks at times but man that sense of exploration and the boss battles and like the the, di- the dynamic physics and everything like that is such a great selling point so it's not a hard recommend because of the weaknesses of like quests and maybe variety for some people in that in that frame rate. But if you like RPGs and this is something that you're into, you're, you're probably going to get some enjoyment. Yeah. All right. That's entirely too much fantasy game talk for me. I need to oh, I need to throw in some Star Citizen just to like oh god <laughs> just to calm Let's my go. nerves. Okay, just to cleanse, uh, just a nice a nice purge uh, for everybody here who for everyone here who's like. Please give me some like some FPS or some sci-fi or something, man. Uh, I won't keep it too long, but yeah. Star Citizen conducted a test over the weekend that is oh boy. possibly the most important test that they've done for the game just about ever. Okay. Uh, remember all that cool server meshing tech they were demoing at Citizen Con that even you I were do. like, damn, that looks cool. Yeah. They demoed three small rooms with a couple of players in them transitioning, and each room represented a server. And players could seamlessly transition from one room to another, and there would be no visible indicator that you would transition from one server to another. Like and no you could, stutter or lag or anything yep, that was just You could shoot cool. across it. You could pop the tire of a vehicle on the other side of the server with your gun. You could jump midair. They crashed it and recovered the servers. Uh, and everybody came back where they were. Very cool test. But it wasn't at scale. They were showing it in three small rooms. Well, right. the test over the weekend was at scale. They server meshed the entire Stanton system... And planets were on, I don't know if they're on one server or multiple servers, but they were on different servers than the space server, the space around planets. So as you went, quantum traveled through space to a planet, you would then switch servers seamlessly uh, and then go down to the planet. It was not quite the seamless. Seamlessly, the 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 quote thing makes me a little scared. It but was very, go on. Cl- it was very close to being a fully seamless experience, except for the systems that they said they had not migrated yet to okay. properly properly do it. Um, heads up display stuff would sort of turn off and then turn back on. Uh, ah. You couldn't target somebody across servers with, like, lock-on targeting for spaceships. Okay. And I believe you would also lose, or there were, there was issues with the quest system between servers, which they said they hadn't figured out yet properly. So they were still working on, which honestly sounds like the easiest side of server meshing. Yeah, you, I would, think, you would assume so. I think they just haven't done that because they're like, we'll get to that when, like, when we figure out the hard part. Get but, the foundation down. But... They could you you could transition from a server, and what was cool is that the planets in the in the game rotate, right? So when you get close to uh, when you when you get into the orbit of a planet in Star Citizen, you actually orbit with the planet, but the servers are at the orbit point. So if you transition from one server to another, you'll start to see a guy like start orbiting around the planet, and he'll just like float away from you, which is funny. Because they yeah. had to figure out that problem somehow. Because either uh-huh. you you program in orbiting physics and real gravity to the whole game world, which, let's be honest, we don't want. 
Yeah, uh, you don't need that. So they broke the servers up into the orbit range of the planet and not. Uh -huh. So, yeah, as you transition over, you enter the orbit range of the planet. So if you're on one side and I'm on the other, you'll start orbiting the planet. I'll be like, bye-bye, Matt, you know? Bye-bye. So it works. It looks cool. Um, and they scaled it up from they started out with 200 people in Stanton. Then uh -huh. they bumped it up to 400, which worked. It, it was a little less stable than 200. And then they bumped it up to 800 just to blow the just doors off of it. Really? Yeah. Push and that, it. Di that did not work well. Okay. Um, but it's exciting. This is this tech is supposed to roll out at the end of the year with 4.0. And it's the first time that I think they might actually do it because they're Sick. actually testing it now. They're doing it now. They're actually doing it. They're actually doing it. So it feels like a kind of an unreal experience because they've been talking about doing this for so long and now they're actually doing it. We're like, wait, That's so cool. we're supposed to be getting promises about this in the future, not actually test it for once, but yeah, it's happening. Awesome. It's, it's it's exciting. Yeah. It's for, not a game changer just for this game too. Like if if other devs can start using this tech for yeah. really literally anything cuz mm -hmm. it it could revolutionize multiplayer video games literally. Yeah. Every single MMO on the planet should want this tech, not just because it allows them to create transition points wherever they want because if you've played like World of Warcraft for example, those transition <laughs> points are very obvious they'll usually put it at the end of a forest you get there and then it loads into the next zone or whatever mm -hmm. having a seamless transition point anywhere you want not only gives you freedom in how you build your world you don't have to make these very obvious transition points from forest to to dry plains or something like that that looks kind of unnatural if you think about it but it's also once they achieve their goal of dynamic server meshing, where each region isn't just dedicated to a server, but now the regions dynamically load onto servers based on how many players are in each region, mm -hmm. where ultimately their goal is to let a spaceship be a server. If you have a hundred players on a spaceship, the game would just decide that there's so many players in this one zone that we're going to make a spaceship a server, and then the space around the spaceship will be a different server. And that allows them to save a ton of money on server costs because it's optimizing the server. Because otherwise, with World of Warcraft or something like that, you have a server for this region and a server for that region. And if there's only 10 people in this region and 100 people in that region, well, you're not really that well optimized. You know, you would like it to all optimize perfectly. And so the end goal of this is really good optimization because servers cost a buttload of money and that's why a lot of yeah. these live service games and multiplayer games end up shutting down because they're like sorry we can't afford to pay 50 we grand a keep month the servers going when yeah. only yeah when only 60 grand's coming in and we still got to play pay our dev team on top right. of that so it's it's good news if this tech can be ported elsewhere and i i hope that cig is able to sell off this tech to say unreal or unity and let them make their own server meshing stuff because it's been in the work for so long i'd hate to have to see these other companies develop it on their own in addition you're like yeah you've already we've already done the work we've already gone through the pain like let's share the technology yeah no yeah. i hope that they would too yeah Battlef of battlefield could do it we could have, we could have had those 128 player servers man it would have worked flawlessly i think that's the least of battlefield's problems where at least it was at launch <laughs> well actually what well, kind of was a problem because there was lag and there was oh god that was a disaster yes speaking of live service unless you wanted to keep going with star citizen i don't know i don't want to no that's pretty much it okay that's awesome news though like yes. that like i said could completely revolutionize gaming for yeah literally like just across the board um live service do you hear marathon has changed direction you know marathon the bungee game yeah yeah, they announced that there or apparently I don't know if it was a leak. It's hard to tell these days what is real and what's not that they're moving towards <laughs> a news. more hero based experience. I did see that. So, here, yeah, the, the whole, yeah, somebody somebody in at Bungie was like, I got an idea. Now, this oh. is this might sound a little crazy to you guys. I, I just came up with it out of thin air. What if we had heroes for the characters and you yeah. you got to pick from different hero classes and they had different abilities uh, i am so done <laughs> so done with that i 
I don't know why they're so fascinated. Is it just because like if they do, if it's done well, you get Overwatch at least at launch where everyone falls in love with all the characters. Yeah. And as soon as you get people attached to those characters, they're probably significantly more likely to buy microtransactions for said character. Bungie people is buy good the really at characters. Cute. They are pretty good at them. They are. People want to buy the cool tracer outfit. They want to buy the, the Winston outfit, whatever. I, I understand yeah. that. But man, from a gameplay standpoint, it is getting quite old and it's not what I was expecting and not what they were describing. I thought Marathon to really even B. So yeah. now you're going to be choosing from different characters and heroes to then bring into this extraction looter game. What's wh what's the gameplay loop all of a sudden? So it sounds like Bungie is very much grasping because they're trying to make the next big thing. And yeah, let's be honest. Bungie has been pretty freaking lucky with their track record. They went from Halo to Destiny. Like, I mean, yep. two juggernauts, essentially. They sold off Halo just as it was becoming stale, you know. Uh, not just as, but, you know, it was kind of good for them in the long run, if you think about it, considering how Halo's IP has held up in many regards. But uh, now they're trying to, they're trying to, they're trying to do a three-peat, right? They're trying to yeah. have the next major game, and it sounds kind of uninspired. The artwork that it, on their, their little kind of cyborg people thing looks neat. Bungie's great with art. But that's about the only part of the game that sounds inspiring, or rather looks inspiring. There was some behind closed doors play tests, and I tried to get information out of people who went there. Uh, those NDAs sounded pretty scary. None of them would talk to me. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't blame them. But from as the they, as they shouldn't talk to you, level cap. <laughs> but from the kind of I won't even say information, the sort of responses that I heard from them, it didn't sound like they were impressed. It sort oh, of no. sounded like it's a game and we'll see type okay. reaction. So that's about all I could kind of decipher from those people. But um, I hope that they can make a good next game. I don't want I Bungie's do, do next too. game to fail, but them sort of throwing out firstly extraction battle royale type vibes you're like okay uninspired you're just following the trend then throwing right. out hero classes okay yeah following the trends yep. where's the thing that makes your game cool unique and different because even if destiny wasn't the most creative game ever it did do a new thing it did take an fps and turn it into sort of this RPG style game, like successfully, right. which, which was kind of unheard of. And a lot of people weren't with it because we're like, what, this is a fantasy game. I don't get it. You're mixing genres and it's not what I expected. And I didn't like it. And then it exploded and was super successful. Um, I'm actually surprised that destiny was successful as it was at launch because yeah. I know mean, it was Bungie, and I know that that initial, but like people look back and they're like, oh, Destiny 1 was better than Destiny 2. It's like, do you remember Destiny 1 at the beginning? Yeah. Because I do, and it was rocky. <laughs> it was very rocky, and they didn't have like end game for the longest time. And it is surprising and there was, and that there was no story, and there was a lot of false promises that weren't delivered. I remember them saying, like, you see that mountain out there, or you see that, you see that, you can, you, you're going to be able to go out there and travel. It's like, and that just was not in the game. I think, at all. I think Bungie just muscled their way into success because it kind of did a little bit. Yeah. Bungie has so much clout and the marketing for destiny was really good. Like it, it was, it was solid. You had Peter Dinklage in there and all that stuff. And like, even the bad stuff about it became memes and people were pumped. I mean, like it was a whole phase of gaming where people were like, Oh my God, destiny is going to be the biggest thing ever. So it must have sold insanely well. And then people a couple months later were like, uh, did you guys all run out of stuff to do in this game? Cause yeah, we all ran out of stuff to do. Yeah. So I think they just made so much money that they managed to muscle their way into destiny too. And now Bungie. And to their credit, they've stuck with it and they've, they, there's been goods and bads, but they've, they've done it. I think for the most part, a really good job. Yeah. Uh, it sucks that Marathon is something that people are mostly just being like, the response is mostly just, I don't, I don't get it. Like, what are you guys doing? And nothing well, we haven't, shown so we haven't far. seen anything other than the, just a promotional at all. Yeah. But they're, it's going to be, it's going to be difficult because they're, uh, it's, they're going for that Tarkov looter stuff. 
And there's never been another game that has been able to match the success of Tarkov. And even Tarkov struggles trying to like get revenue now. They're they're adding in their own microtransactions because they need that influx because uh, Arena didn't seem to do very well. And they're like, okay, well, how do yeah. we monetize this and keep 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 the lights on? And I wonder too if because Tarkov seems to have found its success at being so effing hardcore, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess you could say Hunt Showdown has found its success in there too, but it's sort of yeah. like a lesser. That's a, that's, a, that's a little bit. It's it's a very different game. Yeah, very different. But those games also seem to succeed because they try and go for such a hardcore approach. Like mm -hmm. you lose er in in Hunt, even though it's less hardcore, you do lose your character when you die, which is right. always. Like, even for me, it's a bit of a turnoff at times. I'm like, dang it, I, like, just got all the cool abilities I wanted, and then I died, and I lost all my stuff. Now I just gotta start over again with mm -hmm. a new character, and that's also the appeal to the game, and that seems to be what brings people back to the looter shooter. So could, could Bungie make an accessible looter shooter that's less punishing? It almost seems contradictory, but... Who knows? I mean, I think they're they're gonna make it, and we'll just see what happens. Uh, hope if it's a huge failure, though, Bungie seems to be putting all their eggs in one basket to a degree. Um, yeah, they, they they really are. Well, I mean, they they do have the final expansion for Destiny Two, yeah. but and they it sounds gonna, like they realize yeah. that this is like a break, kind of a make it or break it moment for them because the last expansion was just a big miss. I, I played yeah. it and. It was not, <laughs> it was not very good. Like that there sucks. were some redeeming qualities, but it was, yeah, it was pretty lackluster. So this is kind of like their last, it's the final arc of their story. It's th for this, this light and dark saga. And if it doesn't succeed the way I think players are hoping, it's going to be pretty, it's going to be a pretty big hit on Bungie, I feel. Yeah. Now, speaking of final chapters and sagas, what'd you think of uh, Battlefield 2042 season seven? It's assuming it's the final season. chapter it it's is a season. season it's a season for sure i mean it's technically it's officially a season yes and it's it's fun i i, I enjoy the game uh the recoil changes don't seem to be as severe as i thought they were going to be with the visual recoil yeah they they still feel solid i barely There's, noticed it, it to be honest i barely noticed it too Weapons feel a little bit more punchy, which is, things, I think, what they were going for. They wanted to make it feel a little bit more, you know, They like probably meaty. shouldn't have mentioned visual recoil at all uh, yeah. in their little thing and just being like, we tweaked the weapons a little and not mentioned it because they got so much flack for saying visual recoil because the, the history with dice screwing up all right. their weapons all the time. And and I feel like they kind of maybe didn't deserve the flack, but I, I they the player base has been rightfully so conditioned to not like visual recoil because it sucks it, it's yeah. not great for an fps and if you go too far with it it completely ruins like any yes. any sense of being able to aim properly dice has a long storied history of screwing up their weapon balance yeah. time and time again and then they'll do things like battlefield one and battlefield five where they had like weapon 2.0 where like a year after the game launched, they had to just rebalance everything, you know? And you're like, yeah. can we just not stop? Just leave them alone, guys. Yeah. It's good enough. Stop touching it. The map, I can't even remember what the map is called. Yeah. It is It reminds me of Arca Harbor from yeah. Bad Company 2, where it's got like this terrace system where it's got a bunch of different levels and all the buildings are even from literally They're, Bad Company Exactly the same. I'm... Yeah. I don't know what bat, what the Frostbite Engine map editor workflow is like, but uh -huh. that map should not have taken... That map should have been like some dude screwing around for a week at it does, most. It does remind me of more of a mod than yeah. it does a brand new map. Yeah. It's just all this. All the assets have already been made. They're all thrown in there. They they all the like the crashed uh, VTOLs and stuff. I mean, like, come on, you broke a VTOL in half and put some fire on it. Like, you're not making a whole bunch of new crap. You're throwing in assets, which I'm fine with. I'm totally fine with it. Yeah. But if you're gonna use assets like that and just throw maps together which we've seen battlefield do in the past and do a great job with it with like battlefield one expansions and stuff i they had many great battlefield one expansions that all had the same buildings from the the launch game but if you're going to do that give us some more maps <laughs> rather than yeah. just one little one favela or, type well, we map. are getting this we're getting the stadium to return 
but not at the start of the season. Mm. It's going to be at the in the middle of the season. It's like, just please. a drip. It's a drip feed that's and the drip is getting slower and slower. Yeah. I thought the yeah. drip was going to speed up a little because we we're getting one. Well, I, I mean, gonna, technically, I, I, I don't know if we're is. getting anything after this. I thought it was going to be yeah. like a one last, just like here we go. This yeah. is you get two maps. Enjoy, have fun. Like this is probably the final season. Yay! But it's just God one, one only one map. I, I hope that changes the, the map next isn't bad. I don't, I don't I think, think it's the, sustainable. the map is fine. It's fun. And I think it would yeah. have made a perfect like one of three or one of four. Yeah. It could have been the smaller of like a map pack, right? Because mm -hmm. it is a pretty small quaint, like it's your infantry, mostly infantry focused map. Yep. Cool. It plays well. It's fun. It's neat. It it doesn't do anything crazy. And then you have the big crazy map in addition to that. And then maybe a medium hybrid map. But it's just, yeah, it's it's so little to try and burn through when a new DLC comes out. And you hop on and you're like, oh, are we just going to keep playing this map on repeat? Like, That's what I did. Yeah, it's it's rough doing that, man. It, it's not fun. Yeah, and I, I know that they've been doing this the entire time, but it's <laughs> the straw came out. The straw is part of the pass, and yeah. I bought I, the skip version because I got all the coins from every other battle pass and never spent them. So I just have like five thousand yeah. battle coins. Like I was like, well, I might as well spend this on the upgraded version of the battle pass, which gets you to level twenty. In yeah. the day that I played, I got to thirty. It requires you to get to level thirty-seven to unlock the straw, which is a grind, especially if you only if you didn't get the, the yeah you have to do it week version. by week because then the new mm -hmm. challenges come out and they give you the boost. But the more you play, the less XP you get. Yeah, uh, so it's like it's sort of disincentivizing you to play for extended periods of time. So I haven't unlocked my baby yet. Unfortunately, I can't wait. I'll probably I'll probably play more this week because I really want it. And this raw was yeah. my fa one of my favorite weapons in the Battlefield franchise, like ever. I love that thing. But yeah, these these grinds to just keep you coming back. It's like just let me play the content, please. Just like just like with the the stadium, I was like, just please, just let us enjoy the content. This drip feed nonsense yeah. is just annoying. It is annoying, uh, <laughs> and I I. I'm actually surprised that 2042 has so many players in it right now. Its concurrent player count has been pretty healthy. And I'm, I am I think maybe they're doing some sales or some stuff. I know you've been able to get the game like dirt cheap several <laughs> times. And mm -hmm. I think recently they had a sale too. But um, yeah, the player count's pretty high. And I'm, I'm honestly surprised by it because I'm like, there's just not that much new well, I think content. It is, I think it is a solid game now. I think it's I think it's it's a it's fine a solid game. game. So maybe it's people coming in later who didn't yeah. have to, who weren't getting drip fed content for years and years because to you and I we're sort of like yeah we've played this map a billion times right it's kind of old hat but if you yeah, came if you in come right in now late and you're like oh there's all these now reworked maps and yeah. there's the new ones and the, you, you you'll get enjoyment out of that yeah especially for the price cost of whatever it is on sale like you can 10 get 10 bucks yeah you're yeah, like sure bucks, it's absolutely like a great buy for 10 bucks if yeah. you get to go re can you regrind old seasonal content like I wonder mm, if there's works. a way to get the weapons and stuff i believe with okay. challenges yep. yeah I've always wondered why they, um, uh, some games let you go back and like select the season that you want to progress on, right? Or you're like, mm. oh, I want my XP to count for this tree. I don't know why games just don't do that because then w w when people come back into the game way later and they're like, oh, I missed two or three seasons. Now you have two or three seasons of battle pass content to go towards and you could potentially pick what you want, which seems like it's an obvious or easy win but very few devs do that they're just like nope it's the fomo thing you got to come in while it's always hot. the fear of missing out level cap yeah yeah. I, yeah yeah i'm getting a bit tired with fomo tactics but it is i, am too. I think it's here to stay man it really is but all yeah. in all i i enjoyed the season the, the season seven's fine it's more content it's not bad content it's perfectly perfectly average for 2042 for 2042 <laughs> below average if you compare it to say call of duty but then again everything else is 
below Call of Duty's con- qu- quantity of content. They just throw so much stuff into that game. That I haven't like, really been, I, I didn't even know that. I don't really pay attention to Call of Duty after launch usually because I, I have my fun and then I sort of peace out after like a couple of weeks of playing. Yeah, it's not really my jam too. It just doesn't jive with me. But every time you see a DLC, it's like pages of stuff. You're like, oh, that's cool. Oh, they added a new game mode that does all this. They added this, they added that. Like they're really throwing a lot into it. Even so, it's That's hard good. to appreciate it when you don't like the game as, or it's not your jam as much. But it's kind of hard to deny the amount of the amount of content that they come into. It's good. I'm glad. I'm glad the people that are able to keep playing have something to do. Yeah. Now I know one of your favorite games that you're always telling me about, Undone. Uh, an article. Undone. On, Undone. You haven't played Undone, Un- Matt. Yeah, Undone. Yes, my favorite game, Undone. I mean, Will I'm Smith sure is I... in it. You haven't oh played. Oh my god, I did search for this. Yes, it's that survival game, isn't it? Yeah, uh... Uh, Undone featuring Will Smith. I Will only Smith. apparently I covered this game a couple of years ago. I covered. I mentioned it in like a news story or something yeah. a couple of years ago because I, I made a tweet about it recently. Because there's an article talking about how this game bombed, and everybody was like, yeah, maybe it bombed because I've never heard of it. <laughs> yeah, I didn't hear about it either. I literally Googled it like a couple days ago, and I still forgot what it was to, when you mentioned it now. Yeah, so it's I think it's a Tencent, Tencent funded survival game that looks like an I Am Legend ripoff with Will Smith as the main character. Okay. And it's mobile and pc okay no wonder it kind of looked like a mobile game i'm yeah. like these graphics don't look inspired and they look really outdated yeah so <clears throat> from what i've read it's a really bad pc port um mm. it's basically a mobile game and they're like oh well we can easily make this run on pc let's just add it to pc and the controls and everything are of are course. absolutely terrible but the article about it bombing was it kind of it made me chuckle a bit because apparently there was 300 devs working on this and this was like a wow. huge 10 cent investment and it bombed so hard that they canceled all these other projects but you look at the gameplay and the trailers and all that stuff you're like i don't see that money like i don't know yeah. where that money went uh other probably all the jokes are that the money went into will smith's pocket because that's they have a cool trailer that's will smith shooting some mutants and stuff in the apocalypse and then yep. and then the gameplay plays and you're like what the heck is this <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. what the the uh-huh. trailer team got all the money and then they had like five people make a video game or something it uh mm-hmm. it's just a funny little news story that's been going around because one nobody's heard of this game Two, Will Smith is on it, and so there's tons of the fact that I, that like Will Smith was a part of the project, and I had never heard of this game before. At least it, it never made an impression on me. Yeah. Baffles. I mean, Will Smith is legend. He is legend for constantly investing in the dumbest, weird sci-fi projects ever. Like, I'm okay I, with it though. Give, give, give me the weird, dumb side. You know, sci-fi. When was the last time you liked a Will Smith movie, Matt? I haven't watched a will. I don't, I don't, you know what? Good point. Yeah. What are you okay with? What was that one where he was like, uh, fighting clones of himself the whole time? Oh, I didn't watch that. Yeah. I yeah. Didn't, Cause I didn't it looked that. like absolute trash. It looked really bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like I love those movies where the actor is so full of themselves. They're like the only person that I could possibly fight would be me. And then be they're myself. like, they're like this will no, be the ultimate the acting one challenge. was pretty dope. I remember the one, the with one is comically ridiculous. I mean, it was, I liked it when I was a child. Okay. I liked it. Yeah. Back when that was back in the era of when people like would go to the movies to see a dumb action film, you know, mm-hmm. uh, back when you're like, yeah. yeah, sure. I'll just, what's in theaters right now. The one let's go watch that. Oh, it's Jet Li just punching people and kicking them in the face, you know? Yeah. Good times. Good times. So, uh, what, uh, what stuff have you been watching lately? Well, I finished off Masters of the Air, yeah. and uh, I cried at the end because they show all like the, uh, the 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 actual real people, and yeah. I, was, it, I got really emotional. I was like, "Oh my god, I feel like I've been traveling through this hell with you," and yeah. to see that you made it and you like had lives, I'm getting emotional thinking about it right now because it was. I really, know, dude. Yeah, it was it was heartbreaking, but also like happy at the same time because of all like just what they went through, right? So that was fantastic. I really enjoyed it a lot. Uh, I felt like it was a little slow. 
they it, like it it's you know it was it's war it's it's awful right and it's not always it's not glamorous it's not glamorous at all and it's it's the slow you're just marching and it's awful and mm -hmm. so it was it was pretty slow at times but i love the i love the people the character i was gonna say characters but they were real people yeah and i highly recommend it the other show unless you wanted to unless you want to discuss more on that i think we've talked about it quite a bit i recommended it like last podcast yeah. you've uh, go watch masters of the air if you have the opportunity it is mm -hmm. Up there is one of the best World War II shows ever made, right next to Band very, of Brothers. Very well done. And The Pacific, which was also great. Yeah. I then also binged uh, The Three-Body Problem. Have you heard of The Three-Body Problem? The uh, it's a threesome, basically? Like, no, who do you no, spend the no. time? Are you them or the other? No? No. That's not it. No. Okay. No. So it's also, it's, it's sci-fi. Yeah. Speaking of, and I've, I've heard of it, but I have no idea what it's about. Okay. I don't know if I want, it is the weirdest. So it starts off kind of like a, a, a murder mystery where you're like, oh, okay. Kind of gruesome. Like there's people dying and you're not really sure why. And yeah. then, so the, the, the first couple episodes I felt like were really strong because it sets this premise and you're like, it, there's the mystery behind it. You're like, what's going on? And I love mysteries and there's like some sci-fi in there like what is causing mm -hmm. these things to happen and then they tell you why these things are happening like oh that's really cool that's interesting and then it sort of peters peters out um mm -hmm. at the end and i still recommend it for people that like sci-fi and so th the season's over and i enjoyed it and if they go the direction that they're going, I'm excited for the show a lot because I think it could potentially do some things that like a lot of sci-fi do not do. And that's exciting. But there are some really bizarre like choices and character decisions and things like that. It's, it's a little CW where you've got a bunch of young people or that look relatively young, like in their like maybe early thirties that are apparently some of the smartest people in the world, mm. like physicists. And you're like, this is kind of hard to believe that you're, <laughs> are they I all mean, not, super hot by any some chance? Of them are, like, yeah, gorgeous. And yeah. Not, 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 it's not like they're all smoke shows or anything like that. It's not, it's, yeah. you know, but they're all fairly young and they don't really, really establish in showing them how, why they're the best of the best when it comes to this, you know, why they're so smart. Yeah, And it also has the problem where everyone is connected, you know, it's like, oh, the boyfriend is actually really important. And for some reason is now working on the project of this thing. And the, you know, their friend is who is, yeah. So it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's hard to describe because I don't want to spoil anything. Yeah, I gotcha. I gotcha. It sounds like there's some fun little plot twists in there, but I have been hearing things about, some of the, I, I, again, know no idea what the show is about, but I've seen mm -hmm. headlines for articles where they're just like, mm -hmm. what on earth is this show thinking or, or, or stuff along those lines. I feel like opinions are kind of mixed on it because yeah. it, like I said, it starts off really strong, but then it, what it, it has like really interesting ideas, but then when it tries to play out those ideas, it doesn't hit as well as I think it could have, which can kind of make it feel a little bit lackluster. Um, man, does it go through some ideas though? Like it feels like different shows. Like you start watching an entirely different show by the end because yeah. the, at the beginning, it's like, this is sort of a murder mystery and a mystery of like, what's going on. And then they tell you what's going on. Yeah. And then it, it literally transitions to something almost entirely. I, I love shows that can do that. Well, have you ever watched mm -hmm. Atlanta? No. Oh my God. You are miss. That is one of the greatest shows ever. Really? It starts it's, it off. A, is it a comedy? Yeah, it's it's comedic. It has a mm -hmm. lot of funny bits in it, but it's sort of like dark comedy to a degree. It's um it starts off as basically uh Donald or uh yeah, Donald Glover. Donald um, Glover, yeah. He's he's kind of like down on his luck guy who's trying to represent his friend as like an aspiring rap artist in Atlanta and to sort of okay. build up his brand and his label and you're like, "Okay, this is going to be a show about kind of climbing the rungs and sort of going through the trials and tribulation and eventually establishing yourself and creating like a career and kind of the story about that. And it's, and it's well told and it's done, but the show becomes, <laughs> it just goes so beyond that. 
in this like surreal metaphorical sense and there's episodes that i i think about like a couple times a week they're so good they're just like Jeez. there's episodes in there that are just so fantastic and it's it's hard for me to they have all these funny cameos from actors in there they have uh -huh. um they have that guy from the barbarian movie i can't even remember his name now barbarian? but the um the viking movie what was it called you know what i'm talking about I don't, unfortunately. Oh man, I can't remember his name, but he's like this really well established actor and um they just have him play all these like kind of comedy versions of themselves in the show. And um yeah, what, what was that movie name? You've seen it. It's Northman? North Northman. Yeah, have you seen that? I have. Yeah. Alexander Sarsgaard, that's it. Yeah. Okay. So he yeah. yeah, I know who you're talking about now. Yeah. He's in it and he he's in like a single episode playing himself but like this just deviant of himself and it is okay. fantastic and he's <laughs> and he's like super upset that he lost the baby shark movie and stuff like that <laughs> like he did <laughs> It's just like all these great lines in it. It's impossible to describe why that show is great because it is just so weird and wild and mm -hmm. it has commentaries on like every aspect of life mixed okay. in so they sort of get you with like this simple premise and then the show just becomes i think there's four seasons becomes completely, completely off the different. rails but fantastic like every you just don't know what you're going to get each episode that kind of feels like what the three body problem is going to be doing because yeah. as i said it starts as one and then transitions there's even like a video like it turns into like a video game at one point i'm not even kidding it's it's weird and then it transitions to like science and trying to s solve something and then the next season if it goes <laughs> the way i think it's going is going like hard sci-fi which is well maybe not hard sci-fi but like futuristic Harder. yeah <laughs> it, it's like futuristic and okay. it's it could be really fun. And from what the sounds of it, the first book is the weakest out of the bunch, which is what the, the, and then the second book is where things get like really interesting. So I'm hoping that there is a season two because I enjoyed it, but what a bit, a bit of a roller coaster of emotions where it started off really strong, had some fun moments, but kind of petered out at the end because it just was not what I was expecting at all. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I'll put it on my list for sure. We're still working through Shogun, which is, Oh it's, yeah, Heard it's actually things. getting a lot better. Uh, I mean, it, it was never bad, but okay. I'm getting much more into the show now. And okay. just my god, I can't get over how horrifying feudal Japan is. Oh, <laughs> like yeah, I, I'm sure medieval Europe and you know Spanish Inquisition, all that stuff was just like nightmarish. But it seems like feudal Japan was just that almost all the time, or just their honor stuff is, well, it is so it crazy is a, it is the media you know it's it's not like a time capsule there it is a story yeah but it's it's not even the battle stuff that is horrifying to me it's the it's the rules of honor samurai. within their society so if you and well it's not just samurai that have to do the honor stuff it's like villagers if you are dishonored as a villager you like you have to kill yourself or they'll kill you or something like that <laughs> it's insane it's totally crazy it's, it's just bonkers yeah show's really good highly recommended um i think there's still several episodes left in season one so i'm waiting on those ones to drop i did go back since since i'm waiting on shogun i did go back and i started watching monarch because i was i heard good things about monarch which okay. is the have you seen it no it's do you know what it is a little bit it's like it's like a godzilla tv show that apple oh, tv yes. did okay i was thinking something i was thinking uh the, the queen there's a show called the queen i was thinking monarch okay go oh on. yeah different kind of monarch yeah, yeah i guess the monarch in this is more in reference to a butterfly which i guess is kind of in reference to mothra or something i don't really know okay. actually they, i don't think they've explained it yet in the show but uh or maybe monarch is part of the godzilla lore somebody's going to be upset that i don't know it because how dare you because the show actually does a decent job of tying into some of the Godzilla movies, which I have oh. to admit, I stopped watching after they went to the core or something in one of them. Did you watch that yep. one? Yep, I did. Yeah, I watched that. I was just like, what? Oh, no. There's an entire planet in in our planet. Inside of our planet. And its, and it's physics are different. With, with 
giant creatures like and a we're monkey. gonna fly through it with some dumb spaceship thing that we have for some reason yeah. and my god was that that movie. they're just fun dumb like it hitting was. things with giant creatures they were yeah, fun I, but that's where i fell off but, that's where i yeah. fell off because there was the the one that had like brian cranston in it and it was like taking godzilla more seriously and i I was kind of on board for that version of Godzilla. I was like, this is cool and interesting. And then there was that one with the core where it's just like going the fast and furious route with Godzilla, where you're just like, I don't even, anything could happen in the next scene. And it would be totally, it would fit in with all the insanity that's been happening so far. Yeah. But Monarch is, is kind of taking a fun, more serious, a little bit lighthearted, but a more serious approach with it. And it's good. I'm enjoying it. It's tying the movies together. There's, it's kind of getting into this sort of secret agency that's dealing with the monsters and researching them and trying to predict the attacks and stuff. Um, I'm I'm not through it yet, and I know it's kind of old hat at this point, but I I have been enjoying the show. Perfect. Yeah. I'll have to check it out. Yeah, got great CG and giant monsters that come out of the ground and tear people up and stuff. You know, what's what's not? That's to like. what I'm looking for. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> any um, any any anime or anything like that that you've been watching? Not not too much. I finished off the book that I was reading, The Dark Age, which was the fifth book of Red Rising, and okay. I loved it. It's probably one of my favorites, but. The original trilogy, I think I've, ta I've talked about this book before, and the original trilogy is one of my favorites, and I always recommend it to anyone because it's just fantastic. Okay, so Red Rising is a is an original trilogy, and now they're writing yep. more books to it? Yeah, so it's 10 years. So the, the series now is, there's three books. I think there's going to be one more after the original trilogy, and I always recommend the, the original. This one that's 10 years after feels like it grew up 10 years, and... Like the original is brutal at times. This one is in your face with the brutality. And yeah. I always, like I said, always recommend the original trilogy. I do not recommend this one to everyone <laughs> because okay. while I loved it, it is, if you're squeamish or you're younger, it is not. It's, gotcha. it's, 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 yeah. Is it like Game of Thrones brutality? Yes. Yeah. Actually, further, honestly. Dear God. <laughs> Almost to the point where I'm like, there was moments where I'm like, okay, author. Okay, okay, Pierce. I think his name is Pierce Brown. This is this is getting a little bit too far. Like, I, well, I, don't I mean, mind like, because the Game of Thrones with like cutting off the dude's thing and all that. Like, is it that level of just. It's, it's, yes. Damn. <laughs> it's, no, there's moments like yeah. where people are, I, I don't want to go into, you know, because we're okay. on YouTube too. Yeah, fair um, enough. But it's not. It's it's just like people doing horrible things to each other, and it all makes sense within the world that he's created, and it's war at a like a really large scale, and so there's going to be horrible things that happen, and it all feels true true to life, and and there's nothing like, but sometimes it's just like, okay, dude, you don't need to describe like either my new details of like how bad this yeah. is, because I do have Red Rising on my radar, and I'm gonna I'm gonna probably do an audiobook of it as soon as I like think about as soon as I have a nice block of time to audiobook something, yeah. I'll get so I into still it, recommend man. I still recommend this like the book because it's like I said it's one of my favorites like I love the characters it feels very real but I can't recommend it to everyone anymore because it's just it's very adult in that sense. Gotcha. Well, that's cool. That's a good recommendation. Mm -hmm. um, I want to tell you about F one, but I think we should do it in the post podcast show. Fair I'm enough. I'm excited mm -hmm. about the season. Uh, some cool stuff happened in the last race. But uh, yeah, if you guys enjoyed the podcast, check us out on Patreon if you want to come watch the shows that we record live on Mondays, and then you get to come to the after show thing. Also, the, the links for the live stream are posted in our Discord, so anyone who's a Patreon member can come by and watch the after show discussion at a later time if you wish. And um, Matt has some valuable advice for all of us now. My valuable advice about. today is if there is someone in your life that you appreciate, let them know you appreciate them. Give them a hug. Tell them you love them. I appreciate you, That's Matt. That's my advice. You know what? I appreciate you, Level Cap. Thanks for being my friend. <clears throat> it's good advice. That's, it's good advice. advice. Sometimes we sometimes we we take it for granted or we just assume people around us know that we appreciate them or how we feel. And you know what? 
it's always nice to hear it, right? It's it a is. good mood They're booster, nice right? I don't think anybody mm -hmm. doesn't enjoy being told that they're appreciated, you know? Yeah. No, guaranteed. If you have a friend and you're like, hey, I appreciate you, they're gonna be like, oh, damn, okay. Yeah, I appreciate you too, bro. Yeah. <clears throat> it is wholesome. It is wholesome. All right, guys. Thank you so much for joining us for the podcast. We hope you enjoyed it. And uh, we'll see you next time on Wednesdays, as usual. Peace out. Take care.